Welcome to the Clarified Realty Podcast, exposing the real estate secrets your agent doesn't want you to know. Here's your host, Tom Clary. Welcome to the Clarified Realty Podcast. I'm Tom Clary. I am your host, I'm a real estate agent licensed here in the beautiful state of California. Uh, we are recording this on Friday, March 17th. It is St. Patrick's Day. Everybody has already started drinking the beer. I am jealous as all hell. I can actually look through my window over here onto the right of me and see people imbibing. I am want to get started on this podcast right now. Ron, how are you doing today? Ron Bruno, everybody. I'm doing great, Tom. How are you? Good. I'm doing all right. We have a really great guest today. I'm really excited to get to. Uh, his name is Darren Schlechter, and he is a real estate attorney uh, that has a focus in terms of bankruptcies. And I think he's going to give us a lot of great information today about people who are going through uh, potential dips in their lives, uh, issues in terms of paying their bills, and uh, really give great advice. So I'm really excited to have him on. But first off, uh, we want to talk about, is there any news out there? Sure. Yeah. So what happened earlier? Earlier this week was the Fed. You know, they 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 decided they met in March, and Janet the Yellen. Secret society. Yes, the secret society. Exactly, it's the skull and bones. Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, the uh, the folks in Washington got together and they decided, okay, we're raising rates. Right. Well, you know what happened right after that, right? Well, I know. <laughs> Do well, you want to tell everybody else? Well, of course the rates went up, rate, right? No, of course they didn't, Ron. But they didn't. No, they didn't. Why didn't they go up? I'm going to tell you. Do you want me to be the expert, Ron, or you mm, can be the expert? No, I will, I will say You're so. the mortgage guy. Why don't you go ahead and tell everybody? Tis true, tis true. So what was really interesting is that the Fed, they most people knew the Fed was going to do something in March. So they were anticipating this ahead of time. So the traders and the markets and... What was interesting was not that the Fed just decided to do what everybody thought, but what made the market go down, so interest rates actually went down after the announcement. And the reason why is because instead of saying that they're going to raise rates four times this year, the Fed actually gave guidance and said it was only going to be three. Right. Right. So the significance there is that most people are thinking that oh my gosh the federal reserve they're having to play catch up and now that we have trump he's going to turn us into an inflationary you know right. tyranny whatever whatever it is right and the fed said well wait, wait wait we've got healthy growth and we're not just having to play catch up and we're not so far behind the eight ball where we're essentially you know in trouble we're all screwed no it's 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 going to be healthy growth and they tempered the expectation so the market liked that yeah right so there was there was a rally in the stock market as well as the rates went down because you know the investors they bought the bonds right right i mean that's i think that that's the key that i think everybody needs to start to get in their heads they keep on thinking that when uh, the, you know they hear about the fed raising rates that oh okay then my you know interest rates on on mortgages are going to go up they're not necessarily tied they're very um actually the the closest indicator is usually the the treasury it's a 10-year treasury note right. right which and by the way it's not even necessarily tied to that it's really tied to mortgage bonds and so when the market goes down in terms of when the rates go down that means that there's actually people moving away from mortgage securities because they're basically they're bringing the prices down to influence people to come back into the mortgage market and so that's that's really kind of what we would we saw happen over this past week. Um, so it's interesting to see the slight move away from the mortgage market. Uh, is that a precursor to people not necessarily thinking there's going to be a robust housing market coming up? Uh, it's something to think about. Yeah, what I was going to add is, you know, I, I see this as a positive thing because, you know, the danger is if the Fed really got it wrong and didn't raise rates fast enough and they had to play catch up. Well, if you raise rates too much, too quickly, then that can cause a decline in the prices, the home prices. Sure, absolutely. Right. So uh, it also affects the affordability when it comes to uh, obtaining a mortgage. Right. So by having this, you know, this gradual, you know, step back and then 
and then just gradually growing. I think that's that's a good sign. No, I, I, and I don't disagree with you. I think anything that that keeps mortgage rates from skyrocketing is healthy for the market, and I'm, I, I encourage it. But at the same point. For those of us who are nerds who want to know kind of the uh, the gears underneath the hood, that's that could very well be what we saw. So something to, something to think about. All right. Well, listen, let's go ahead. And I want to bring in our guest for today's episode. It's uh, Darren Schlechter. Uh, Darren is, uh, like I said, he's an attorney. He's special. He he's not, he's, has a focus in bankruptcy, but you're a real estate attorney. Let's really, that's what you're. That's right, Tom. Yeah. Right. And uh, and he does he does a lot of real estate law. He, he provides also, you provide pre-bankruptcy planning right. as it, well. Right. And assistance. That's right, Tom. That's right. And I wanted to just say I'm thrilled to be here today with both of you. Um, a lot of what I do is meet people um, when they are about to file bankruptcy. Sometimes they come to me after they've already filed a bankruptcy, and I have right. to kind of clean up the mess, um, so to <laughs> You're speak. You're part-time janitor. Yeah, part-time janitor. Seems to be on my job, <laughs> my description too. But <laughs> problem solving is you know at the forefront, creating you know creative strategies sure. um, for consumers and small businesses, um, whether it's a uh, you know real estate issue, um, litigation, right. um, consumer or medical debt, you know, the, right. whole, the whole host of things. You're right. And I, I just want to say that we're going to focus mostly today on, like I said at the top, the folks who are going through um, kind of issues in terms of debt going, you know, am I going to lose my house, that kind of stuff. And we'll get to that. Um, but but just to kind of start off, start off, let's just get to know you a little bit. So tell us about like, how did you, uh, when did you become an attorney? What led you in this direction? Right. In law school, um, I was focusing on a lot of uh, financial law classes and I saw uh, a poster to extern for a bankruptcy judge. And I said, well, this is interesting. Right. So uh, I applied. And at the time I was actually writing an article, a law review article, because I was on law review at the time, um, before and after the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act. Uh, regarding whether or not it would hurt consumers. And this is in 2006 before okay. things changed two years later. Right. Um, and so they saw that article and they saw an interest in bankruptcy. And so I externed for a bankruptcy judge in uh, Orange County, um, well-respected bankruptcy judge who helped uh, or oversaw the Orange County bankruptcy. Uh, and after that, um, it was uh, all in financial law. And then when I started my law firm, bankruptcy was just uh, a no-brainer. Yeah, well, because you had spent so much time kind of in there. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming fantastic at it. So, uh, but here's the thing. So uh, let's, you know, when, when we first, it was interesting when I started preparing for this podcast and when I started getting everything all together and, and, and it came to me that, that literally so few people understand what that even means. If they've never gone through a bankruptcy, if they're just a general layman, right, you hear this term, bankruptcy, it's like this dark cloud on the horizon that you never ever want, you know, well, we don't want to go in that direction, right? But you don't, you hear like chapter 11, chapter 13, all these things, and it really doesn't compute. You know what I mean? Right, right. There, there are a lot of different bankruptcy options. Um, and getting them to understand what those options are. They'll walk through my door in my conference room and I yeah. like to say, my style is I tell it like it is. Right. You know, sometimes there are deer in headlights when they walk in, when they walk out, they feel, um, they have a lot greater clarity of what what their options are right. and that bankruptcy is the last resort. It's not their only option. Right. And that ultimately, and this is the important thing to remember is, it's their decision. Right. I'm here to educate them so that they understand what why they're doing it. The worst thing is when I talk to people who come to me after they file the bankruptcy with another attorney and they say, I don't even know why I'm in bankruptcy. Right. So they have to be uh, part of the process, educated, and that's a better client. And it also leads to a better result, frankly. Right. So I think to kind of pull us into this kind of world, I really kind of want to set up a scenario basically. I think it's probably the best way for us to kind of all walk through this door and really kind of understand the concept, concepts back and forth. We're going to, everybody step in the shoes of a person who basically, we're going to say that they had some sort of, uh, some sort of medical emergency or cancer or some sort of horrible thing has happened to them and they, they survived it. But unfortunately they've got hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical bills. Um, they have a home, uh, you know, we'll talk about equity and things like that, but let's just say that they've got a home right now. Um, they walk through your door and they say, what do I do? I, I can't pay my bills anymore. Right. Well, the, the first thing that I, I do is I look at their tax return and determine what are the cash flows like? What is an overview of their financial situation? I'll look at bank statements. 
what I'm trying to determine from the initial meeting is, are they broke and they have the inability to file uh, to pay back their debts and maybe could be eligible for a chat what's called the chapter seven liquidation right or they have the ability to pay back some of their debts through what's called a chapter 13 or a chapter 11. Let, I think it might be just so that we can start all off on the same page. Let's go through the different chapters. I think that that's probably a good place to start and what each one means and, and what the limits of each one is, right? So we have chapter seven and that's liquidation of assets, correct? So basically that's like starting from ground, basically. Right, the chapter seven is considered the fresh start, the, the, the supreme haircut. Um, turning you know uh, debt of a hundred cents into to zero for most debts. There are some debts that you can't just ride through a chapter seven. Correct. Um, but, but they're for people who really um, you know you know living in Los Angeles can't afford. They're they're barely making ends meet. Right. They basically have negative what's called disposable income. Their expenses exceed their income. Right. And so for the near or midterm future, they're not going to be able to pay back their debts. And Chapter Seven um, is the right option for them because they have uh, a variety. Um, you know, my rule of thumb is you know when they have three or more. Uh, creditors and they have tens of thousands of dollars and they're, you know, they're making a certain amount of income chapter seven, they may be eligible for that. Right. And if they've really exhausted all of their other options, right. right? I always tell them again, this is your decision. This is the last resort. Right. And you don't have to do this. Right. So they have to be comfortable with that. And by, uh, by other options, I think that what you're like, are, are we talking about like going to some sort of credit management bureau or something like that? And I'm, of course, a reputable one. You want to make sure that you are talking to someone who's basically not going to take advantage of you. But you're talking about basically rearranging their own, on their own, their own debts, correct? Right. Some of the services that I do offer are if someone comes into my office and says, well, I have one or two credit card debts or um, debts from uh, a lawsuit, it might be cost effective to hire me to try to negotiate those and say, well, this is the person's financial situation. I can prepare a bankruptcy petition to show them that they to show the creditors that they can't pay it back. Um, they could also do um, consolidation through some companies um, and um, they could also negotiate themselves. So there are other options besides bankruptcy. And, and it sounds to me, and not to get ahead of ourselves, but that's sort of a, a reorganization kind of on their own. Right. right. Without the actual claiming bankruptcy. Yeah, it's 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 considered an out of court workout. Right. Is what it's called. It's basically let's avoid the the impact on my credit, the possible stigma, um, the cost and uh, and other factors that go into deciding whether to file the bankruptcy and just resolve it that way. But the great thing about a bankruptcy is if if it's right for you, yeah. it's the right. It's a great form for both debtors and creditors to come together and figure out how to resolve their issues. Right. That's one of the best benefits of a bankruptcy. And, and I think that I, I, one of the things when we finish going through these chapters, I really want to talk about the stigma and the, that kind of emotional kind of stigma that's kind of attached to, you know, oh my God, if I declare bankruptcy, my life is over, kind of thing. And and I think that that's that's so completely not true. I mean, there are some people where it's literally it's the reset button to get you started going back up again. Right. The, the, the benefit to a fresh start is greater than the stigma, usually. Right. I would say probably one out of every five clients have that issue about stigma, but they're usually not Chapter 7 clients. They're usually ones who uh, want to go through a reorganization and pay back their debts and right. want to try to avoid that because right. they reputational value. So, so back to Chapter 7. Chapter 7, we've got... So it's basically a, there's a... They dissolve all the assets pay off all the creditors, and then anything that's not left is basically zero. Well, yeah, in, in a chapter seven, essentially, you draft a petition that says, I don't have the ability to pay back my debts, and I have no assets that could be used to pay back my debts. Right. Um, there is a trustee who uh, has the debtor declare under penalty of perjury, under oath, um, that they reviewed their petition before they signed it, and a variety of other questions to make sure that they understand you know, uh, the impact of the bankruptcy and the seriousness of the process. Um, and then um, the trustee being satisfied if there are no assets assets and there's no cash flow says you're entitled to what's called a discharge, which is a piece mm. of paper under federal law that says you don't have to pay back certain debts. Right. Now there could be disputes later on about which debts were discharged and which weren't, but 
we'll save that for another podcast. Now, because we're talking, you know, because this is a real estate podcast and, and, and people who are listening to this are going to be focused on, you know, look, I want to keep what's important to me. And nine times out of 10, that's my home. I really want to try and hold on to my home. Is that is that possible under Chapter Seven? And what is it, what are the different right so scenarios? So when a, thanks Tom, when a client comes to me and uh, is current on their mortgage, does not have any past due, what's called a rearage as a term of art in right. bankruptcy, um, then they can the they can file Chapter Seven and and have the house be protected as long as they're current and it'll ride through the Chapter Seven. If there's past due, then chapters 13 and 11 come into play as to a plan of action to pay off that past due over a certain amount of time. Mm. I never advise a client to file chapter seven when there's past due because it's, it's just too risky. Interesting. Um, and I like to uh, advise clients of all the risks up right. front as much as possible. So you can mix and match the chapters. Well, if you, you can convert between chapters, okay. but um, I like to plan all the way to the end. And you yeah, know, I've never had a client complain that I plan too much. Right. So <laughs> that, <laughs> this, that, he actually made his money. Y- y- Darn him. <laughs> that's right. That's right. right. Yeah. And, you know, I find that um, having them understand why they're doing it and understand at least uh, the procedure and the timeline helps with the, with the process and getting the discharge or getting the result. So um, that's, that's really key. Got it. So um, now if let's say that I'm in arrears um, and uh, there's a chance that I'm about to get foreclosed on, um, is there a possibility to kind of say, oh, well, we'll hold everything because that's on a timeline as it is. Correct. Right, right. Yeah. Usually people are coming to me when there's a notice of default or a notice of trustee sale um, and there's a pending foreclosure and I can file what's called you know, chapter 13 or an 11 if it's appropriate, depending on the other circumstances. And that will basically uh, invoke the automatic stay under bankruptcy law that prevents a creditor from going after the property and completing the foreclosure. Got it. Now, but I have now something I had heard, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, that if uh, if let's say that there's no equity in the house, though, that's that, that, that there's kind of like a fine line there. That if there's if there's equity in the house, then they'll have that conversation. But if there's no equity, there's a, an issue with basically they want to get it on the market as soon as they can. Right. So if you're in the creditor's position, and sometimes I do represent creditors, which actually helps me in the representation of debtors because I can see it from multiple perspectives. They will go in and ask the bankruptcy court for permission to um, get what's called relief from the automatic stay. So in addition to bankruptcy being a great forum for resolution, there are two other main benefits to bankruptcy. One being the automatic stay that says you can't go after the debtor while they're in a bankruptcy. And number two is the discharge, which is the fresh start the, um, you know, paying back a percentage of your debts in a 13 or an 11. Right. But if you're the creditor, you're going to want to go in and say, well, you know, um, the debtor has been making payments, there's no equity in the property, and the creditor's position isn't what's called adequately protected. So then the bankruptcy court has to make a decision and say, well, you know, all those things being true, we're going to grant what's called relief from the automatic state, permission to go after and continue on going. Yeah, to continue to foreclose. Right. um, Because the debtor doesn't need the property to reorganize for cash flows. Um, uh, and when right, so basically they're saying that, that basically, look, even if they sold it today and they were able to get a hundred thousand or zero, let's say it would be, it'd still be negative hundred thousand. It's not going to do them any good to keep that house. Right, exactly. I mean, it gets all to, it's going to do is create more debt for them. Right, it, it, and and if they're and if they can't keep up with their mortgage payments, yeah. it's indicative uh, of other problems in general. Right, right. So bankruptcy can't always solve all the problems because when you're paying back. Uh, and making payments in a chapter 13 or a chapter 11, you also, uh, you, for your mortgage, you also have to make payments to the trustee who's overseeing the bankruptcy. Got it. Especially true in a 13. Got so. it. Okay, well, let's let's move on to chapter 11 then. Let's go, so that's probably the most la- logical next step is into the 11. So we'll ta- go in a little bit briefly about, would that even be for an individual? Because I think that's the, the, very predominantly kind of corporations do chapter 11, but Right. Where would it be useful for a person? Uh, Chapter 11s um, can be useful for an individual. Um, The cost is substantially different than a 13. 
most it's most often you know the notoriety is yeah chapter 11s for big businesses right um and i have you know uh, a few chapter 11s right now one and if it's good enough for our president it's good enough for us <laughs> right <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a good plug right there it's, and, it, and it's true you know i find that a lot of my chapter 11 clients aren't um they're not poor they have uh more than adequate cash flow it's just that some type of litigation event um, or other event that over leveraged them caused them to have to say, well, I can pay this much for this type of debt and this much for this type of debt and we'll try to work it out. Right. And sometimes it's just used to basically get people to um, realize the, the debtor's financial reality to say, here's how it is. Right. Right. Um, but I have chapter 11s right now for individuals. Uh, it's just that um, the general rule is there's an eligibility requirement at 13. I don't want to bore everyone with it, but no, uh, but there's no debt limit in a chapter 11 or seven. So you could have as much secured debt Got or it. unsecured debt in those chapters in a 13. Um, and that's why the cost of a 13 is also lower compared to an 11. Uh, back to sevens. Are there, are there limits on the sevens? There's no, there's no debt limit on a seven. Okay. It could be as much debt. It's just that, you know, stockbrokers can't file all chapter seven and there's other, other uh, right. ineligible. Oh, and by the way, back while well, since we're visiting seven again, we're going backwards. <laughs> uh, the, the ones that you you said that there are certain debts that can't get paid up. We're talking about student loans. We're talking about uh, uh, spousal support stuff. Correct and right. So so there are certain exceptions to discharge that are that are automatic. Um, domestic support obligations are one, and th there's a lot of nuances to that. Student loans, um, you know, are not generally dischargeable. Um, there are programs right now for, uh, I know, for the public student loans, but private, th th we're still waiting for legislation on that. Mm -hmm. um, taxes can't, it, with, with some exceptions, cannot get discharged. Um, and there's a whole set of rules on that. So you definitely have to see a qualified uh, bankruptcy professional to make sure that um, they analyze each type of debt that you have and the character of it. Got it. Okay. Now back, moving on chapter 11, we're back to chapter 11. So, um, it, let's say that I, once again, we're in the pl st situation where, uh, I want to keep my home. What's the, what would you recommend? Like in terms of taking care of protecting, I don't want to say asset protection because that kind of gets into a completely different kind of trust kind of situation, but what would you, what, what kind of uh, suggestions you would would you be giving me to kind of help me to say okay listen before hopefully before you declare bankruptcy you're talking to Darren and you're talking to him and saying hey what should I do before you go into a chapter 11 what are you doing to kind of get your ducks in a row well yeah and that's part of the general analysis um, the tax returns the bank statements um, you know the overall review of the financial situation I have an intake sheet um, that asks a series of questions to cover all the issues that you're going to experience during the bankruptcy. Right. Um, so most of the work is front loaded. Is, is our bankruptcies kind of a standard thing? Like, is, is it a widget or, or is it, are there, you know, it's so interesting because every time I go to buy or, you know, when I'm going with a buyer or when this, you know, a listing in a house or whatever, every single one is so different. Is it, is there any kind of like uh, continuity to every single one of these or no? I, I wouldn't say that there's even to the different chapters. I mean, if you were to say, oh, all chapter 11s have this kind of continuity to it. Every chapter seven kind of has this continuity. to it. Right. Well, you know, my chapter 11s are unforeseen litigation events, not because someone spent so much in consumer debt um, that that's more properly, you know, consumer debt and medical debts more in chapter seven. Right. Um, in 13, you find past due on a principal residence. Maybe they have a second property that they also want to, you know, try to reorganize those debts and a variety of other debts like taxes. Yeah. And they're a business owner. Um, 11s I find are professionals, business owners who, you know, uh, I had one recently, uh, the guy was a business owner and, you know, just had a lot of litigation and most people can't afford the yeah. type of war chest that you need in order to pay to fight it, to fight, to fight it. those battles. And it's better just to go into bankruptcy and basically, you know, um, uh, modify expectations about what can be paid sure. back or is basically just like a, you know, not necessarily a white flag, but a flag that basically tells people, you know, yeah, right. more like a red flag. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. So, Any flag, just yeah. basically stop punching me. Yeah, right. Right, exactly. And, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it's the breathing spell. Right. So, you know, the filing of a bankruptcy basically slows down the, you know, the creditor impulse to um, aggressively go after someone uh, unless they know something about your financial situation and then bankruptcy right. can't solve all those problems. And we're talking about like if they're, if they're 
smart enough to kind of look around behind the curtain and see maybe some assets that are being creatively hidden someplace or correct. I mean, right, ex exactly. And I like to say, you know, when they're in my conference room, you know, imagine this is a glass house and you yeah. have to disclose everything. It's right. important that you disclose everything. Uh, and I usually grill them because it, they're going to be grilled by a trustee or by a creditor. And I've been on, you know, at least the creditor side and I know, you know, what they're, what they're going to do. Right. So, Absolutely. And, you know, uh, another case that I have right now, um, uh, you know, I'm representing um, uh, one business owner against another in a chapter 13, um, and it can get very uh, uh, aggressive and costly and expensive sure. to, to, to represent people. So the, one of the benefits of a bankruptcy is saying, well, let's just agree to disagree and figure out a way to avoid the costs mm -hmm. because they're so expensive, especially in a Chapter 11. The, right. cha the costs of a Chapter 11, even on the individual side, are going to be at least 50000 For a business bankruptcy, you're looking at multiple hundred thousand dollars because you're running a business through a court. Right. And necessarily, it's going to be a number of hours of work sure. with professionals and things like that. Absolutely. So um, are there any specific difficulties uh, in keeping a home under Chapter 11 as compared to 7? Or is it easier to keep a home under Chapter 11 versus Chapter 7? Well, in a Chapter 11, the, the flexibility of what you can do with modifying uh, real estate loans is greater okay. than a 13 on balance. Right. Um, and that's why a Chapter 13, there are set limits, at least here in uh, Southern California, on what you can charge um, as debtor's counsel, representing right. you know the borrower, um, for a Chapter 13. And there's those debt limitations. So it's more of a fast track reorganization bankruptcy. And in 11, um, you have to get people to consent to your plan and agree to your plan. You have mm. to get a certain amount and number. Interesting. And it gets a little bit more nuanced, which is why the cost is greater. But people who are filing... Uh, for and is that something that you're handling, that kind of communication between all those parties to make sure that the negotiation happens in a way that your client makes it out. Right. right. You know, in, in chapter 11s, you're usually hiring, you know, professionals, like sometimes real estate agents, financial mm -hmm. advisors, CPAs, you have bookkeepers, right. um, you know, it can be a whole uh, host of professionals that are helping you make this work because, um, you know, even with a background in, in some tax and, and financial uh, experience, you need those professionals so that the bankruptcy court and, and the, the trustee knows that you, you're going in with the right professionals and you have a plan of action. That's the key. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, chapter 13. Chapter 13. Give us a little bit of a kind of a, you know, a short kind of definition so everybody kind of understands in a very kind of simple way what that means. Right. A, a practical reorganization. You have enough money to pay off um, unsecured debt, at least some percentage. It could also be uh, what's called the 0% plan, meaning um, you can pay back some of, some of your debts, um, but you're really dealing with paying taxes back and mortgage debt back over three or five years. Okay. So it's, that's kind of more in the, the, for the home mortgage kind of Right. And for, taxes. Yeah. You know, I mean, for uh, a lot of homeowners, even in Los Angeles, um, for instance, the, the, the secure debt limitation in a 13 is roughly about 1.2 right now. Okay. Um, and, and the unsecured bucket, I like to call it, is about $400,000. Right. So uh, most properties in Los Angeles, at least on the west side or in, in LA in general, are about 1 million, maybe even more with past due amounts and fees that the bank charges. Right. So then they're pushed into an 11. But if they can qualify for a 13, it's um, quicker. Um, I would say, you know, less costly, definitely, than an 11. Right. Um, and um, you know, from the start, whether it's likely to work or not. Got the it. The writing's on the wall, right. so to speak. So you don't yeah. get full on halfway through and it's like, oh, this ain't gonna work. We right. went down the wrong road, wrong road here. Right, and, and exactly. And, and, and uh, you know, going back to your comments about the interest rates, now we're in a market where bankruptcies are primarily precipitated by litigation because we're in a high valuation market. Mm. Um, back in 2008, 2009, 2010, when values were lower, there was an easier way of modifying real estate, yeah. home loans and loans in general, right. because they originated a bad, they, the deal originated was bad. And now, you know, the values are lower. And so the tide, you can change the tide down to, you know, what the marketplace accurately reflects now. Got it. So, okay. So we've now kind of, um, now uh, let's say we've gone through these and one of these different chapters and 
can I, let's say that I, I have a house, can I downsize rather than sell the house outright? Like, can I like, if my, I owe a certain kind of debt, can I just kind of go down to a smaller home maybe so that I can stay in a home, but you understand what I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah. So you don't have to sell the, like everything and just not be able to have a house again. Yeah, I mean, in, in a chapter 13 or an 11, you can surrender and or sell property. Um, and 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 uh, ask the bankers who are permission to you know get loans and um, you know use the proceeds from that sale to to buy another property. The the point is is that the the purpose of these bankruptcies, especially with regard to real estate, is you entered in in a bad deal. You yeah. didn't know it. You had a variable interest rate. Yeah. Right. right? Or you know negative amortization, reverse. Yeah. I mean, all these things that could really hurt consumers yeah. and they don't really understand what it means for them because oh. they're just uh, treading water absolutely essentially yeah. you know with with the interest rate um and uh it was just a bad deal and they want to cancel that bad deal right and there's ways of doing it you can surrender the you know the collateral to the bank cash for keys there are all these other programs of just delivering the possession back and saying well at the time you know i thought i could afford it they thought i could afford it but it's really not yeah. You know, we're, you know, reflective of my financial reality. Yeah. Um, Ron, you had something you wanted to... Yeah, I was going to say, you know, what I've seen recently have been not necessarily the first mortgage, but it's the second, the HELOC. I mean, I mean, the, the most extreme form that I've seen so far is, you know, the borrower, they had a 520 FICO. They had a first loan at 700000 They had a HELOC that they used as a piggy bank, and it went all the way up to $700,000. <laughs> so they now have $1.4 million. They have a nice place, you know, it's, it's, it's worth about maybe $2.6 million. But what really happened was that HELOC has now gotten out of the interest only period and is now fully amortized principal and interest. On top of that, it re-amortized to a 15 year period. So their $2,000 HELOC payment has gone from $2,000 to $7,000. Oh, man. Ooh. Seven thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, and 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 unfortunately, I mean, this is something we've talked about on a previous podcast. We might see more of these. There was kind of this um, renaissance of HELOCs that happened about five. What was it? Five to ten years ago, or whatever. Yeah, they were really popular when the when the interest rates were going down and people were refining. Right. And and I mean, they were. I mean, HELOCs. They they came with every loan. Yeah. I mean, basically, it was like the you know you would get a stuffed animal when yeah, you're right. signing at the, <laughs> you bank, the bank to set up for a checking account. <laughs> And, and hey, and, and here's your brand new HELOC. Here's your HELOC. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and what, what you know, in, in those cases, you know, those those have kind of gone by the wayside. But, you know, nowadays, uh, those that have gotten HELOCs, they have to really, and I stress this all the time, you really have to stress and understand and really monitor that interest only period. Because once yeah. it goes out there and it gets re-amortized, your payments are going to spike. And if, and if you do a combination of, waiting and using it as a piggy bank and letting those balances climb and climb and climb and climb, right, right. forget it. Right. And, and my experience is um, representing debtors who have fixed interest mortgage loans, a lot easier. Yeah. No surprises. Sure. Um, you know, even if uh, in a chapter 13, I get a, a debtor's plan confirmed, if it's a variable rate and we don't negotiate, you know, and it's very difficult to, to modify the interest rate in a chapter 13, but they're still in for surprises, like you just said. Yeah. You know, because the HELOC's trying to protect its position sure. and avoid being a sold out junior loan. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and by the way, I, I don't want to be like too sour on, you know, uh, variable, uh, variable rate interest loans. I don't want to, you know, there's a place for everything. We're not, uh, all we're just saying is make sure, I, you know, that this, the whole theme behind the entire podcast is to be educated, to educate you. Don't be afraid of it, but just, you know, make an educated you know, decision for yourself and be aware of what's happening with it. If, yeah, if, I mean, the best way to describe a HELOC, it's like a credit card, it's right? Like, you just have to know what your APR is. You have right. to know what the interest rate it is and you have to know what you're getting into. Yeah. I mean, if you come to me 10 years later and it's like, oh my God, I'm now, like you said, like $7,000 and it's like, well, yeah, you, why were you not watching? Somebody was asleep at the wheel. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we want to make sure that we're, we're hoping that we're getting through to you guys is that you don't have to be afraid of it, but be aware. Um, so, Okay. Uh, now let's talk a, a little bit about, and I, we haven't, we've kind of, I don't think we've really kind of touched upon this, the uh, homestead exemption. When, how, you know, can you go into a little bit of detail about what that is? And 
how valuable is it in terms of the whole bankruptcy scheme? Right. So in uh, in bankruptcy, you have uh, 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 exemptions that protect your real and personal property. Um, there's two set of exemptions. Um, and depending on what uh, the debtor's financial situation is, whether they own a home, whether they have a business, you know, what they actually have to protect, the bankruptcy professional has to decide what is the best um, uh, exemption set to use. Right. Um, the homestead exemption only applies under one set of exemptions, and then there's what's called the wildcard exemption for uh, you know Chapter Seven debtors that don't own uh, a house but have bank accounts and a variety of other property where that would be more proper. So basically, the the homestead pro- uh, is is about real property. The wild card is about other assets. Right. And they're under, you know, the wild card's under um, what are called the 703 exemptions, and the homestead exemption is under 704. Okay. So if the debtor has equity in their property, you could still qualify for a Chapter 7. You just have to be very careful, get the right valuation professionals, get the right appraisals, and make sure going in there's not going to be a question about whether there's equity that cannot be protected by the homestead exemption. So let me just so that I can kind of give a very basic kind of how I understand the homestead exemption. And please, by all means, (laughs) the attorney at the table should uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, But the way that I understand is, let's say that we have a home that is uh, worth $500,000, right? And we have, let's say, uh, we've we've paid everything. uh, Let's say we paid $100,000 down. So we have $100,000 worth of equity on it. So that there's basically, you know, the, the loan on it is 400000 What we're going to get back at the end of the sale is 100000 Well, there's the homestead exemption that basically says, well, there's a certain percentage of that 100000 or whatever it is, that is going to be protected, that the, your, your creditors can't grab. Correct? Right. Am I understanding it correctly? Right. That's correct. Hey. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, and we're done today. And thank you very much for coming. No. Well, uh, like I said, it's important for everyone to get educated in the process. You don't have to be an expert necessarily yourself, but you right. have to understand the, you know, the basic strictures. And Is there a timeline on, on it, though? Like, do you have to get the, the homestead at a certain period of the, like, before you declare bankruptcy it, so as to so, not? Yeah. And then that brings up an interesting point. You know, in my, in my, my understanding is there is no need to file a homestead exemption in California. Oh, really? It's, it's actually automatic. Oh, okay. And, and, Good and to know. you know, pretty well known. Um, and you claim the exemption based on the fact that you have an interest in real property. Um, and there's varying exemptions going, you know, from the minimum of $75,000 upwards. And, and that's where the, if you have a house and you have equity, I usually put my clients in a chapter 13 or a chapter 11 if it's appropriate because um, in a chapter 7, you have a trustee who's appointed to sell assets. That's right. their job. Um, and it's sort of like if, if you give somebody a wrench, everything's a, a, a nut, basically, that, it, right? Yeah, essentially. Or, so. That is really not how that saying goes. <laughs> if, everything, if you give somebody a hammer, everything's a nail. Right, exactly. Thank you. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can you tell that I'm not mechanically inclined in the least? All right. You need a beer. I need a beer. Give me a beer. <laughs> Friday afternoon happy hour, right? <laughs> give me a beer and a hammer. And it's St. Patty's Day, yeah. so it's perfect, perfect storm. Right. But you, you want to do that analysis up front so right. that, um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of um, filings by people representing themselves or sometimes, unfortunately, even with attorneys where they don't plan in advance. Right. They put their client at risk and they put them in a Chapter 7 and the client wanted to save their property. Yeah. But as soon as you file Chapter 7, you're giving up control over your financial affairs to a trustee. God. And you have to know that. Right. And so... Um, especially but that's a huge, that's kind of a, I want everybody to kind of uh, underline that right now that you just heard. Cause I think that's an important distinction between those different chapters and a way to think about it in, in, from a real estate perspective. If it, 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 we're not, I don't think you're saying that you can't keep your home under a, a chapter seven, but you're going to have to be dealing with this trustee who is basically looking to make up the, the, the de- debit somehow correct that, on the spreadsheet. Th- that That's right. If there is any equity and they can make any argument to sell it over and above the homestead exemption or the cost of sale, you know, uh, usually 5% for, for commissions, you know, between the two brokers, then, and closing costs, et cetera, then they will t- hire their own real estate agent and try to sell the property for as high as possible. Whereas in a 13 and 11, um, the, the, the people filing control their financial affairs to Got a certain it. extent and they have more leverage. That's important. That's huge. So you're trading off control for paying back your debt. So the system, um, it's not perfect. 
Right. But it's a much better system than exists, you know, and, and a lot of countries have actually mimicked our system in their and then and, and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, around huh, don't quote me on this in terms of years, but um, five, six, seven years ago, it was a lot easier to declare bankruptcy, wasn't it? Well, it, the the recent changes and it's, it's called BAPSIPA in 2005 arguably made it tougher for people to file for bankruptcy. And my article said, well, you know, is this going to be a curse in disguise for consumers? But I couldn't have, you know, uh, prophesized in 2006 yeah, right. yeah. that two years later we were going to be in, a, you know, one of the biggest, you know, recessions, sure. in, you know, arguably depression uh, globally. Uh, and so it didn't stop people from filing because that was their only option to try to work out their debt, to try right. to maybe pay back their debt, to try to do something. Right, right. So, okay, well, let's, let's take a uh, – now let's – uh, let's say I've gone through the entire process. Well, first of all, let's go back. How how long does the process usually take? So for a Chapter 7, usually from start, from filing date until a discharge, it's about four months. Okay. Sometimes five months, sometimes longer, depending on if there are assets um, that the trustee discovers, and that could, you know, make it last years. Right. Um, a Chapter 13 is three or five years, and a Chapter 11 um, is about the same, but there's flexibility. You can stretch out payment of debts, um, sometimes to seven years, uh, right. I've seen, or 10 years, um, especially working out the mortgage debt, mm -hmm. you know, maybe balloon payments at the end, there, there's flexibility. Got it. And, and let's say that there's a, um, uh, you know, I, I think that there's, uh, you know, we, I have to say that there are some very uh, un, uh, just unfriendlies out there, people who uh, not necessarily take advantage of people who are going through these kind of situations, but uh, l let's just say that I've gone through the process. Am I going to get barraged by like all sorts of people like coming out of the woodwork asking, you know, trying to get my debt still calling me, you know, hey, listen, uh, you owe this, you know, or do they have to like completely stop? When you file a bankruptcy, usually from the time of filing creditors who are listed get notice, you know, through the, through the bankruptcy court within about a week. So the phone calls should stop within uh, about a week. If they don't stop, then they're possibly in violation of what's called the automatic stay. And it's federal law. It's very serious mm -hmm. uh, because that's one of the two one of the two major protections of a bankruptcy, which is stop you don't harassing get harassed, me. Yeah. Stop harassing me. Right. Stop the collection calls. You know, either from the original creditor, or a collection agency, a law firm. Well, and people sell debt. To and debt collector, right? That's right. And so it's like a, you know, I'll sell it for pennies on the dollar, and then you can try to get it basically from the person. Exactly. Or there's a pending lawsuit. There's, you know, um, you know, even the IRS and franchise tax board have to stop, you know, uh, placing phone calls, sending, you know, letters, unless it's for informational purposes only. Right. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a serious thing. Yeah. So uh, what would... It, it, <sighs> I know that you, you can't like, and it is like we've stated, this isn't a widget. This isn't something where everything is every, every situation is going to, you know, match every single thing. But, you know, are there certain things that you, you, in your experience, cause you've been doing this for a while, how, uh, you know, when, when would you tell people like they need to do it? You know what I mean? Like it's, you know, it's, it's time that the, the fat lady's singing, you really need to do this. Right. You have a, you know, a pending foreclosure sale. Usually it's accompanying accompanied by other debt. Um, you know, you have uh, multiple lawsuits. Um, you know, I like to say, you know, you have different types and amount of debt, right? You know, I mean, multiple five figures, it has to be in proportion to what that person's making sure. and what their asset situation is. But, um, you know, you have tax debt, mortgage debt, credit card debt, you know, in the multiple five figures or six figures, sometimes even seven figures. And, you know, that the different amounts and types of debt is indicative of, you know, the cost to try to resolve each one of these yeah. consensually outside of a bankruptcy isn't going to work. Right. So that's why, you know, um, I like to say that bankruptcy in a way is, um, at least for entrepreneurs and business owners, is a way to um, have them move on and allow the marketplace to really do what it's meant to do. So it actually benefits everyone right. to do this. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because, and, and uh, just so everybody knows, I want to make sure that you know, I, I, uh, Darren is, is really good at what he does. And I want to make sure we have him back here to kind of talk about that other aspect of it. That basically from the other side, uh, people who are possibly investors or people who are looking for homes that can 
possibly work with people who are going through this situation and, and to their advantage. And we know, and I don't, and, and there's this kind of like, even when you think about it, it's like, oh, you're taking advantage of these people and you get all judgmental, but it's really not that at all. You're actually kind of helping them get on with their lives, going in and helping, you know, buy their home or whatever. You're not, they have to do that anyway. Right. A lot, a lot of law is psychology and strategy. And, and unfortunately, you know, when, when clients come to me and they're in my conference room, it could be emotional. I've had husband and wife fight in front of me. Um, you know, I've had nothing is more stressful than finances. I'll tell you. Right. You know, grown men cry and I've, and I've seen a, a lot of unfortunate situations, but I tell them my job's to be unemotional and zealous and get you through this situation. Um, so that you can look back, change habits, uh, you know, prevent yourself from getting in a similar situation in, in the future. Because again, the writing on the wall of whether sometimes things will work, there's also the writing on the wall of changing their habits, helping them create a budget, right. having them um, save money, having, you know, so that they have. And, and I think you, uh, you kind of bring this up right now, kind of gets me to, and how I kind of run round up today's podcast is, is really about, okay, how does the Phoenix rise from the ashes? Like, how can you, uh, as an attorney, help set them up in order to get them moving up again. Um, Ron, you can actually kind of interject here as well. It's like, how, how do they rebuild? What do they, I mean, because it's not like you declare bankruptcy and it's like you turn your keys to your life. You know, you have to move on. You have to, you have to keep moving up. Right. So, for, for consumers, it's the responsible use of credit and, right. it's un, and understanding how that impacts your entire life yeah. um, and not living beyond your means. Um, right. I have a lot of people say, you know, when we're trying to come up with a plan of reorganization, I can't afford that. And I say, well, but you don't even know what your income and expenses are to know that that's true. But right. this is where the clarity comes in and the education, because I'm not a widget. Right. And that's important for you know the public to know that this is a process where you are coming out better in terms of how you think about things, right. where, where your consciousness is and your financial literacy. Right. For business owners, you know, these, um, before you file for bankruptcy, for most of them, you have to file a credit counseling course and a financial management course. But for business owners, it does, it's not as practical because they're already doing that. Right. And the reason why their business failed was because of a litigation event, macro or, or, you know, or micro issues in terms of, well, you know, no one wants to buy stone wheels anymore. Yeah. Right. 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 So, yeah. So that that's, those are the two worlds. Right. Ron, you and yeah. And, and, you know, I'm also talking from, you know, I know people personally that have gone through a bankruptcy and, you know, I mean, there's such a stigma when, yeah. it, when it comes to bankruptcy. It's, it's a chapter scarlet 11. letter. Yeah. And, and the irony is that we're here sitting in WeWork Pasadena with all these entrepreneurs that are starting their business and we're going to invite them to, you know, after this to come in and say hi. And you're like almost like the Grim Reaper. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I do end of life care. <laughs> exactly. But what's really, it's funny. I mean, I had, a, I had to couch the invitation and say that, you know, your, your, your real estate and transactional and business and bankruptcy attorney, right? So, right. You couch it at the end. But what's, what's interesting is after you've, you've actually seen a little bit of you know what's behind the curtain in a bankruptcy, you're, you're starting over, right? And it, it almost goes back to when you first got that credit card in college. Usually it was secured, yeah. right? So you're starting small. They didn't give you a $50,000 balance, right? And it, you know, for a lot of people, it was the most expensive t-shirt that anyone's ever acquired yeah. uh, by signing up for their initial <laughs> credit card. True, but that's, that's really what it is, right? So, so you're starting over. So you would get a small little credit line, right? So maybe $1,200 and it's secured and you can't go over that amount. And the idea is that you want to make sure that you're starting to rebuild a solid credit history right? So you're paying your bills on time, that you're not overusing the credit from the standpoint where you're going over the limit or just up against that point. You know, the idea is you want to keep rebuilding and there's good credit and then there's bad credit, right? So, you know, one of the good credits is once you're in that position where your FICO is up to a certain level and you've established a good credit history and you're ready to, to dip your feet back into the actual real estate market, then th there are seasoning requirements, right? So maybe Tom, that's a, a good segue into that. No, I think we should definitely it. go into that and let everybody know that, I mean, by the way, it's it, once you declare bankruptcy, it's not like you can't ever buy a home again or you can't ever buy a car again. That's right. It's not like they, you know, you, you know and, and as a matter of fact, at some point it drops right off your credit. That's right. Rating. And there's some so, people that are so educated about it that the minute they hit that, 
that particular seasoning date, bam, they're out there, they're pulling, you know, they're pulling the trigger and they're making the offer. And then there's others that even though they worked with the judge and they work with a bankruptcy attorney, all of those things, they feel they can never buy. No, it's, right? it's so And it, it could be mind. 10 years. And, yeah. they, and they say, well, I had a bankruptcy. Well, how long ago? 10 years ago. I'm like, wait a second. Right. Right. So general, I'm just going to give just general guidelines. Oh, and sorry, can I just interject here as mm-hmm. well? I've seen cir- circumstances where literally someone declared, declared bankruptcy and it was like whatever the, you know, the five years or six years or whatever, it drops off, whatever. And they were inundated by people trying to give them credit because they they took care of the problem. It wasn't like they just sat there and didn't pay it, because that's another option, by the way, that is right. not a good option, but you know, basically completely not pay them. Right, and then the reality of it is, is that you know, if you just think about it, there aren't that many eligible American citizens you know, for, for credit, so they're, they're, you know, they're working with people who, okay, we'll give you an opportunity to get secure credit cards, rebuild the credit, you know, show consistency right. in, you know, the credit, you know, practices, and that helps repair their situation. So they come out actually better. Right. But, you know, there are the solicitations. Uh, yeah. And, and that's what I've heard from clients. Right. And, and, I, and I hope that one of the things that, that anybody out there who's listening, who's going through this situation, please understand that this is, you're going to move on. You're going to move on with your life. And there are going to peop- be people like Ron. There's going to be people like Darren. There's going to be people like me that want to work with you. That I, I, I don't care. I, I seriously... If you come to me and say, well, I had a bankruptcy. Listen, there are people who have all sorts of other problems. It's just a thing, guys. I would say f- 5 to 10% of my clients have had a prior bankruptcy. Yeah. I mean, it's this is seriously. There you go. You're just going to take a breath. You're going to take your loss and you're just going to move on. You're going to learn from it. You're not going to, you're going to hopefully try to find a way not to do it again. But this ain't the one, end of the world, folks. No. And we're all professionals, right? There's no, there's, you know, we're, we're not judging anybody, right? No. It's it's all based on this is, this, this is just Everybody a Everybody gets so concerned happened. about what mm-hmm. other people think of them. That it, that, it's, that it paralyzes them and they get f- afraid of like, oh, that person's thinking I'm some sort of, you know, um, scum of the earth because I didn't X, Y, or, and you know, no, I don't, I actually want to help you. you. You're actually one of those situations where I think that I can do good. I can actually take you and help you find something. So it's, it, 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 it I, I just want to encourage everyone out there to just don't let this overwhelm you. This is something that you can handle with the help of folks like Darren, folks like me, like Ron, you can, you're going to get through this and we're going to help you get through this. Okay. Or whoever that is that you decide to go to, you know, go to someone else, but you're going to, this is not the end of the world. And right? l- and lenders do want to lend to you, right? Once you've passed certain seasoning requirements. So, so real quick, what you have is conventional it's four years. Right now, you, if there's extenuating circumstances, it could it could be as low as two years. We have and to those years go by those. so fast. They everybody. really do. That's a, that's. I mean, that's you're a gonna, car lease, right? You're going to be over. Next thing you know, you're going to be looking for another house. Do not think that this is going to be some sort of extended period of time. Four years is a blink of an eye in your yeah. life, and it's two for FHA. Right. So that's, 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 that's another, that's another item. And if you really want to buy a home and and you're willing to take a little bit more in terms of the, you know, you look at your, your overall rate, they do have lenders that will do, uh, that will finance one day out of uh, discharge out of bankruptcy. Right, I've I've heard of that before, and and I, and I tell my the, the clients that come in the door after that, look, you know, prior clients have received credit card solicitations um, because there's only so many people to send the solicitations <laughs> <Right>. to. <laughs> they so got exactly, yeah. exactly, because creditors, what they look at is they look at you know different paper, right? They talk about A paper and B paper and C paper and D paper and you know all the way different down the grades line. of paper. There are there there are products for all types of different consumers, right? And right. everybody falls into different buckets, and that person gets that rate, and that person get that. It gets that rate and you know what what if someone really found the home of their dreams and they just i mean they have to have it one thing they could do is they could purchase it with one of those higher interest you know loans provided that they know that there may not be a chance but if they wait to the full seasoning requirement they could refi right so that's that's another that's another option 
Look, I, I don't, I, I don't want to minimize the kind of emotional burden that people who are going through this situation are experiencing. And you're probably, it's coming from uh, after being, you know, another tragic situation, like we said, some sort of illness, some sort of litigation or, or whatever like that. So I don't want to minimize, I'm not minimizing that by saying that you're going to move on, but you are going to move on. Okay, I want you guys to, to feel strong enough to build back. Don't sit there on your couch crying. It doesn't help you. Let's, let's get together with people who are experts and solve the problem. Um, Darren, I want to wrap up. What, are, is, what do you think are your last, what do you think would be any kind of last advice you give to anybody who, who is, you know, thinking about like, maybe I need to make a phone call? You know, better to, to call earlier and just get information. <clears throat> Most of my initial consultations are just about information, um, eliminating the fear and being educated. And ultimately, um, that's what, you know, if some people come in my door, get information, they don't sign up. But I feel like that's as uh, you know, uh, big of a service as the people who do move on and say, wow, you really changed my life and are very grateful to help them during a very difficult, yeah. emotionally charged time. Absolutely. Um, but you know, my job is to be strong for them and help them through you know, this very difficult time and, and just push forward. Right. Well, Darren, I, I can't tell you how happy I was to have you on today. I mean, seriously, really some amazingly important information. And uh, why don't you go ahead and give folks your information so that if they need to contact you or, you know, if they're going through some sort of situation like this, that they've got somebody to reach out to. Absolutely. Well, we're conveniently located in Century City. Um, the phone number is 310-553-5747. Um, either myself or my excellent staff is, uh, you know, on call to answer your questions. Um, uh, my email is Darren, D-A-R-E-N, at SchlechterLaw.com, S-C-H-L-E-C-T-E-R-Law.com. Um, we usually try to respond within 24 hours to any inquiries because um, we know that things are time sensitive. Yeah. And people are just sitting on their couches stressing. That's right. Call, <laughs> call me. Get the information. There's no obligation to sign up, but there is an obligation to help you you know, move on. That's great. Well, thank you, Darren. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks the, for coming. And did you want to, did you have any kind of disclaimer you wanted to give or anything I think you had mentioned before. Oh, you know, it just that it's very important that, um, you know, when you're speaking to, you know, bankruptcy professionals that you ask questions that you get answers and that they, they tailor it, uh, fine tailor it to your situation and that you feel comfortable with them um, and, and get the, the right legal advice. Um, you know, the things I've said today are just, you know, general, you know, pieces of advice, but you need to have someone who's just not going to say, oh, here, you're here to file for bankruptcy and then file it. Right. It needs to be well thought out and planned. Strategy. Um, yeah, strategy. So, strategy. And the creditors will appreciate that because they say, okay, here's a debtor's counsel who's, um, you know, planned all the way to the end. And I usually end up, you know, um, telling them, you know, this is how it's going to go. Right. Uh, and then certainly the, the oversight uh, of the bankruptcy process appreciates that too, the courts and the trustee and stuff like that. So Great. thanks again Great. for having me. Absolutely. Pleasure to have you. Well, that's about it for today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to leave them for us on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Clarified Realty Podcast. All one word. Like I said before, you can email me directly. I've always said this, Tom at clarifiedrealty.com. You guys, please, if you have any questions, email me. I can also set you up with Darren too. Uh, for more exclusive bonus content and advice between episodes, please check out our website, www.clarifiedrealty.com. Also on our homepage, you'll find links to helpful buyer and seller guides that can give you some great information for starting your home buying or home seller process. So check those out. Out, definitely. Uh, I'm on Snapchat, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Uh, my handle for all three of those is at Clarified Realty. I beg of you, come on guys, please, please, please leave feedback and reviews on iTunes. Stop everything. Drop your sandwich. Go over to your computer. Leave us some reviews uh, and or leave them in the comment section on our page. Uh, my amazing theme song, Hey Now, is from the band Wolf. That's Wolf with two Fs. And please go check them out and like them on SoundCloud. Uh, uh, you know, they rock so hard. I I'm going to go bankrupt from buying all of their kick-ass records. <laughs> and uh, just a little disclaimer, Ron and I are licensed by the California Bureau of, Bureau of Real Estate. My license number is 01715353. Ron's is? Guaranteed rate NMLS 2611558706, California. The advice we give is only for properties located in the state of California. For all other states, please contact your local real estate agent or real estate professional. That's about it for me, Ron. You good? I'm good. Let's go celebrate. I want some beer. All right, thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> and remember, the greatest thing you can ever do is make someone feel at home. Take care, and we'll see you next week. Yeah.